you can have ADHD and be quite depressed or anxious. But it also takes a differential diagnosis to say, hey, wait a minute, some of the anxiety really stems from the academic performance issues. And if we take care of some of the ADHD issues, maybe the anxiety is going to subside without needing a lot of treatment on its own. Generalizations about ADHD haven't done girls any favors. ADHD often manifests very differently in girls than in boys. What causes parents, educators, and even doctors to view the symptoms of ADHD differently in girls? We know that masking and even variations in environments often cause symptoms to be missed. How's that happening? And the pandemic has impacted male and female ADHDers. What is that impact? Joining us is Stephen Hinshaw, a distinguished professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at UC San Francisco. We'll talk about girls and ADHD straight ahead on episode 143. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Before we get underway, there is still time to pre-register for our six-module course for educators called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. Independent study registrants get 20% off through October 31st, and the course opens on November 1st. Also, our second course is about dyslexia, and we'll be releasing it soon. We'll have details here on our podcast website and at neurodiversity.university. Coming up next, Stephen Hinshaw is a distinguished professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and 2021 inductee of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the author of a new book called Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls, How to Help Your Daughter Thrive. He joins us to talk about girls and ADHD. Stay with us. On a previous episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast. If I'm working with somebody, they like neurodiversity, right? They've come for that reason. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, it's people who are finding utility in that new label. Mm. But what I tell people is that labels including diagnoses, especially mental health diagnoses, right? These are disorders, not diseases. They're collections of symptoms that we have found it useful to group together. And it is useful and it's valid and it's real. And they're still constructs. We made them up. We made them up because they're useful and they're arbitrarily applied. Two different diagnosticians will give two different responses about what a person is or is not. That's episode 130. Find it in your favorite podcast app. You're listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today, we're talking with Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, author of Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure. It's interesting. Part of the interest with ADHD, obviously, is is related to my own experience. So I was diagnosed with ADHD in the early 90s, which was a time when We were kind of just really starting to learn about ADHD, and girls were not identified very often. I knew a lot of boys that were my classmates that were identified with ADHD, but I can't remember any girls, really. But I feel like even today, there's this lack of awareness about what ADHD really looks like in girls. So can you start us off just by sharing a little bit more about some of the generalizations we can make about how ADHD manifests in girls versus boys? I'm going to go back into history just a little bit. What did ADHD used to be called, ADD or ADHD? Hyperkinesis, hyperactivity, minimal brain dysfunction. And the symptoms placed emphasis on axis if driven by a motor, restless in the squirmy sense, restless always up and on the go, on physical activity levels and impulsivity, doing things before you really thought them through much less emphasized were changing focus as the situational demands change, organizing your day, what we might call some of these executive functions, holding bits of information and working memory. So with the change in name to ADD and then ADHD, more emphasis has been placed on 
the two main symptom dimensions, one, inattention and disorganization, and the other, hyperactivity and impulsivity. We know that on average, whether you meet criteria for a diagnosis or not, boys for a long time in development are more active and impulsive than girls. But in terms of inattention, disorganization, they're about equal in boys and girls, but they don't get detected by clinicians or teachers for a couple of reasons. Number one, inattention itself isn't as visible. I'm not disrupting a classroom if I'm quote, spacing out or not following a two-part demand. Second, I was taught in grad school eons ago that hyperkinesis and hyperactivity really didn't exist in girls. Same with autism spectrum disorders. Same with most other neurodevelopmental disorders. We now know that boys do have autism spectrum conditions, ADHD, two, two and a half, three times the rate of girls. This is probably a biological fact. But for ADHD, as you get older inattention predominates more than hyperactivity and impulsivity, which tends to go down as as anybody gets older. And girls may have been masking ADHD symptoms just because of trying so hard and overcompensating and doing all these compensatory things. Long story short, not just in clinical psychology and psychiatry, but in basic medical and basic biological science, the emphasis has been on males of any species over females. 30% of studies on basic animal research, forget ADHD or anything else, use males only and about 10% females only. And even when you do research on mixed sexes, mixed genders, most researchers don't look for how the sexes may differ on variables of interest. So we have to overcome long-term bias. We have to understand that girls on average are more likely to show the inattention and disorganization than are boys and guys. And that if we don't pay attention to more subtle symptoms and don't pay attention to the impairments that girls with ADHD have, we're going to still miss the boat. I've read a lot, too, about how because those normative populations tend to skew male, then that also then influences what we look for for the diagnostic criteria. That's right. It's kind of a systemic issue that we have to (laughs) figure out where the balance is there with it. Right. So if we change the diagnostic criteria, would there be actually just as many girls as boys with ADHD? Well, if we change the diagnostic criteria so radically that we weren't talking about ADHD anymore, we might, but I think that would be kind of a a pyrrhic victory. It wouldn't really make sense. So let's go to a different example altogether. After the age of 11 or 12 or 13, when puberty hits, in pretty much every culture studied, Girls, then turning into women, have double or more the rates of serious depression than boys or men. It's not true before the age of 10, but it's true from puberty onward. But some people say, but you know, guys get depressed, teen boys and and, and men get depressed, but they might express it through drinking or substance use or acting out, antisocial behavior. But if we put all of those symptoms under depression, we might not be talking about depression anymore. So I don't think for a bunch of reasons in prenatal development, what makes a male a male and a female a female is early in prenatal development, if you've got the Y chromosome, there's a signal very early in in prenatal development for the male body and brain to start secreting androgens and testosterone. So boys are born a little bit androgen poisoned and boys' brain development is slower than girls for many, many, many years. So it's little wonder that social interactions and conditions that emphasize social deficits like autism spectrum are more common in boys. Same for self-regulation, the the hallmark of ADHD. And I don't think we should just try to equalize it. However, very interestingly, if you go from childhood to adolescence and then adulthood, females almost catch up by age 25, 30 and beyond to males, to men, because girls are more likely to have the purely inattentive form that's actually much more likely to persist over time and lead to major problems over time, although often in a more subtle way, not as acting out a way. So sex differences are important, but if we still have the bias that girls can't be, shouldn't be, can't get ADHD, again, we're missing the boat and early intervention is so crucial, we just can't afford to do that anymore. Yeah. 
I, I think there's also just a lot of stigma that surrounds ADHD in general, but especially in girls when compared to boys. What are some of the reasons that you think that parents and educators and physicians even view girls differently when it comes to some of those signs of, of ADHD? There's a couple of threads to your question, and I want to pick up a couple of them. One of the, my lines of research these days is on the whole topic of stigma. Why do mental and neurodevelopmental disorders continue to receive, despite much greater public knowledge of such conditions, receive stigma, have negative attitudes? A lot of it about stereotypes. One of the theories of stigma is that it's really the more severe conditions that get stigmatized. Schizophrenia, chronically hearing voices, having a thought disorder, is more stigmatized than, than minor depression. And, and that's generally true. However, what about a condition like ADHD, which is misnamed, by the way? It's not an attention deficit. It's a lack of regulatory ability to modulate your attention as demand shift. It's a self-regulatory disorder. And that means that, let's say I'm in middle school, and I'm pretty good at math and I do well in algebra, but I don't have very good verbal working memory, and I flub up in English. Well, everybody knows I wasn't trying in English. Because I'm pretty smart. And add that to being a girl. Girls are supposed to be, even in 2022, more compliant and more nurturant and competitive and have to do it in a very sexualized way, which I wrote about in the Triple Bind, another book of mine. Girls have a triple whammy of pressures. And when they don't conform, and when everybody knows, quote unquote, that ADHD is just a lack of trying, families, Girls themselves receive a lot of stigma. Why can't you get your act together? You don't have an intellectual disability. You should be able to do this work. I've seen you do it in period one, but not period two, in class A, not class B. So the confluence of the gender atypicality of impulsive behavior and the expectations that girls kind of do everything perfectly and the consistent inconsistency that constitutes what ADHD is lead to a lot of stigma. And in straight talk about ADHD in girls and from my large research and clinical experience in, in working with people with this condition, it can start really early. Same is true with dyslexia, reading disorder, dyscalculia, math disorder. I must be stupid. Everybody can do this more e easily than I. Why can't I do it if I try harder? Why does the teacher yell at me? Why does no one invite me to their birthday parties because I accidentally blew out the candles at another kid's birthday party when I was young? All of these things tend to deflate one's self-esteem. And for girls in particular, and for girls going through puberty and heading into the teen years, one of the core and very tragic findings that we have found with the B-GALS study, the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, you have to have an acronym for a study so that people can remember it. <laughs> As these girls who we've been now following since childhood until, until their 30s in our fifth wave of data collection, by their teen years and early adult years, these girls compared to a matched neurotypical comparison group are at very high risk for self-injury, cutting, earning so-called non-suicidal self-injury, and also frank suicide attempts. Now, boys with ADHD and men with ADHD at a population level are at increased risk too, but girls much more so. Girls may tend to internalize the negative feedback and the stigma, and with no one to talk to about it and feeling ashamed of their condition, they may not even know they have a condition called ADHD, we have to figure out the kinds of early interventions, and we've got some good evidence-based interventions that can prevent this very self-destructive course. Yeah. In my um, counseling practice, when I work with my clients, I see that connection with the non-suicidal self-injury piece and the and the attention issues. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? And, and like you mentioned, some of those interventions that can be useful? First of all, non-suicidal self-injury has been going up for the last 20 plus years at alarming rates in young people and starting even before puberty, especially in girls in many cases. And it's often hidden because the person, the young person's ashamed, roll down those baggy, long sleeve sweatshirt arms, not tell anyone, and then the pattern intensifies. Well, why would someone, without the intention of ending their own life, 
engage in such behaviors? There's probably a number of reasons, but a key one is I'm feeling a deep pain, but I don't have words to express it, or I don't think anyone will understand if I try to express it, and it must be my fault, and I get temporary relief from the psychological anguish, and this is intensified when there's family conflict or a history of maltreatment, and that temporary relief of seeing the blood ooze. I mean, these are graphic images. It's hard. Or feeling the pain of banging my head against a a, a hard object are only temporary, and I may need to do it again to continue to try to relieve the psychological pain. Rates among neurotypical girls by high school are roughly around one in five girls engaging in moderate to severe self-injury. Boys, about half that rate. If you have ADHD, underlying problems in self-regulation, underlying issues in emotion regulation, those rates are are probably more than doubled. Evidence-based medication can help focus, can decrease impulsive behavior, even more family-based behavior therapy where parents learn to stop the shouting and yelling and struggles, set clear limits, set rewards for small bits of behavior, and then coordinate those problems with teachers and schools, all the way to DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, for teens and young adults who get engaged in serious self-injury are the kinds of treatments we need to promote because if we can start them early, we might prevent what can be a very difficult course, including uh, ending one's own life. Because even non-suicidal self-injury, a history of it is a good predictor. I don't mean good (laughs) valence-wise. I mean statistically strong predictor of engaging in suicidal behavior 10 years later. You might get inured to the pain and get even more hopeless. It's interesting to kind of think about how that all plays. And and you're right, the negative messages that ADHD kids get from a very young age really influences all of that. Yep. One of the other main factors, and this is part of the diagnostic criteria when we're looking at ADHD, is that the symptoms have to be present in multiple environments. That's right. But I think sometimes when you have somebody who's masking those symptoms, or perhaps they're not outwardly struggling, like you said, they're internalizing some of those things, or perhaps they even still get good grades. I hear so many pediatricians who go, oh, well, their grades are okay. It can't possibly be ADHD. It it can be frustrating. So what are some of your thoughts about why seeing some of those characteristics in different environments is or isn't important? And what should people do to make sure that they're not missing those things? Well, I mean, you're raising a lot of good points and questions. And the the bottom line answer is you can't diagnose ADHD accurately in a 12-minute interview in a pediatrician's office. Symptoms of ADHD can be the symptoms of maltreatment. They can be the symptoms of some seizure disorders. People, kids who are depressed can't concentrate because they're dealing with their mood issues. Same with anxiety. It takes a lot of work, norm-based ratings that parents and teachers complete an interview with the child or teen, a long developmental history questionnaire and interview with the family to look at early milestones and to look at speech and language issues and any history of of maltreatment or trauma. When you start to do that, you realize that in grade school in particular, one teacher, a girl's really motivated to do well, the family is struggling but providing the support, she's getting some A's if the elementary school uses letter grades, although one of the hallmarks of ADHD is uh, the A through F syndrome. Every grade in the (laughs) spectrum with teacher comments like, if only she tried harder, Mm -hmm. why can't she get more organized? I know she's got the potential. But still, the pediatrician may think, well, she can't have ADHD. She's not failing. She's doing pretty well. And then middle school hits usually timed exactly with the onset of puberty for girls. And now there's two, maybe in sixth grade, and four in seventh grade, and six in eighth grade teachers, each with a different set of cues and expectations, and sometimes the instructions are online, and sometimes they're on the board, and sometimes the teacher speaks them three times and sometimes once. The criterion that there must be impairing symptoms in multiple settings is good, so you don't just mistake a neglectful environment for ADHD, But a very supportive teacher or a very compensatory family can keep masking the symptoms beyond elementary school. But if you go back, teachers will say, I know she's got more potential. Uh, I didn't realize that she was only sleeping five hours a night to keep up with her studies and social media. 
it takes some intensive interviewing. And one of the things in the diagnostic process is uh, the fourth grade teacher says, you know, she's doing pretty well. But did you ask the first, second, and third grade teachers? The fourth grade teacher may have had ADHD himself or herself and gets it and is really structuring and warm. ADHD is very responsive to reward and to consistent expectations and warmth. So you need to go back historically. to It's like the rings of a tree, right? You want to look for the consistent inconsistency across years. So it's a good idea to make sure that symptoms aren't just in one setting. If a kid is angelic at home and a mess at school consistently, maybe we should look into that school classroom. Maybe there's something called ADHD in kids who show it across situations. But it takes hours to do it right, and often health insurance, even if a family has it, doesn't pay for the thorough assessments needed. And it's confusing. People don't know how to navigate that system. That's right. So then kids get labeled as a behavior problem or a million other things, whatever it might be, because people don't know where to access the help. And until recently, well, she's just depressed. Yeah. As if, you know, sort of slamming depression. Or it can't be ADHD because I never was taught that ADHD existed in girls. So it's easy, quote unquote, to find other problems, some of which may be co-occurring with ADHD. You can have ADHD and be quite depressed or anxious, but it also takes a differential diagnosis to say, hey, wait a minute. Some of the anxiety really stems from the academic performance issues. And if we take care of some of the ADHD issues, maybe the anxiety is going to subside without needing a lot of treatment on its own. You mentioned just kind of in passing about sleep issues. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how that might manifest? I know that might not be specific to girls, but maybe there is a difference in sleep patterns with ADHD girls versus boys. So ADHD is associated with sleep issues, and it's still a chicken and egg problem, even though sleep science is advancing fast. If I'm really uh, driven by a motor, I'm going to have trouble settling down and going to sleep or When I'm a preschooler with the sort of stereotype condition, I wake up at five in the morning, want to play when everybody else is trying to sleep till seven. And so, but even with, and some very recent data of ours that we've submitted for publication, in our girls' sample as they develop in age, it's the inattentive systems from childhood to adolescence to adulthood that are the most predictive of sleep problems later on because you need to stay up later to study. And because you're not as organized, and then the anxiety kicks in, do I stay up late, but my mind is foggy, or do I wake up early, and then I'm exhausted for school? And let's not forget social media, and let's not forget increasing homework and academic pressures and hard to get into the right schools. It's a confluence of factors that makes ADHD riskier, especially in girls and women, for anxiety, depression, self-harm, and one we haven't talked about yet, In our own BGALS longitudinal study, we found that for our carefully diagnosed girls with ADHD, in contrast with our matched neurotypical girls, four and a half times the rate by mid-20s of at least one unplanned pregnancy, 45% versus about 10%. And we know that ADHD has a strong genetic liability, and so both for genetic reasons And for the life stress reasons we're talking about, an unplanned pregnancy can be very disruptive. And if the pregnancy comes to term and the girl, young woman with ADHD becomes a mother, we have a potential for intergenerational transmission as well. So breaking the cycle early, having families recognize this may not be the daughter I expected. Or maybe she is a little more like us than we thought because we have some ADHD ourselves. Mm. A kind of radical acceptance of some of her quirkiness and some of her energy, which if you find her strengths and allow her to succeed in those and provide structure and rewards and medication as needed, ADHD can propel a lot of really good outcomes. But it's a mistake to say that ADHD is just a hidden gift. Oh, yeah. That if we just made classrooms, everybody could stand up, ADHD would disappear. It's not that simple. We need to have flexible educational programs. We need to teach kids with ADHD to focus and have executive functions. But the number one thing is to accept, to promote those strengths, and to find the skills and environments in which she's going to thrive. 
You used the phrase radical acceptance a moment ago. Yeah. How do you connect that with ADHD? So radical acceptance and radical commitment are terms actually borrowed from dialectical behavior therapy, the very intense therapy for mid-teens, older teens, young adults who often have strong self-injurious tendencies or substance abuse tendencies. And often such kids from an early age have been very sensitive to environments, often quite impulsive too. So radical acceptance in DBT means, you know, I'm not like most people. I'm more sensitive to criticism and I'm more intense. I can't really fundamentally change that. But if I wallow in how different I am, maybe I have to accept that. But at the same time, I'm radically committed to meditating and skills and learning to cope with difficult emotions. So in the first chapter, on the second page of Straight Talk about ADHD and girls, my message to parents is radically accept your daughter and her differences after a thorough assessment, but radically commit to getting the best evidence-based treatment you can and radically commit to finding and promoting her strengths. Yeah, I, I think that that's really important. And I think also, like you mentioned, not diminishing or minimizing the struggles that come along with it. That's right. I think that's one of the pieces that's really difficult. Or for parents, when it is that inconsistency, when you right. do see this, it's like, oh, well, you can do it here. You can do it. That's very confusing. Are you trying to drive me crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Why can't you do this homework now? I just sit down and do it. And we talk about motivation in ADHD. Mm. One of the hallmarks of ADHD is a slower curve or trajectory of developing intrinsic motivation for tasks that initially are hard to learn. Now, when you say low motivation, people say, oh, that means you think kids with ADHD aren't trying. They're trying, but some of the genes that underlie ADHD and some of the neural pathways are under sufficient with dopamine and how it's transmitted. So if that's the case, it's going to take longer and with more extrinsic rewards or sometimes with a stimulant medication to help build the circuits and build the skills so that you get the experience with success where you need those rewards, extrinsic rewards, less and less of the time. So motivation is a big part of it, but it's a big mistake to say, you're just lazy, you're not trying hard. Despite efforts, it's going to take some structured teaching to help kids and teens and adults with ADHD do good work. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, for teens and adults with ADHD, focuses on organizational skills, time management, anger control. These are skills you can learn if you go on to post-secondary education, in a job, in a relationship, because people with ADHD often crave the immediate and often don't transition well from activity to activity. Yeah. There's an example in a wonderfully written part at the end of chapter three in Straight Talk by uh, Dr. Sarah Chung, who was a grad student at Berkeley that I knew quite well, who got diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 31 in the middle of a doctoral program. All the signs had been there, but from her Asian background and family low acceptance of kind of divergence from the norm and her own ultimately flailing compensatory strategies she toughed it out in high school and college and early grad school, and her life changed with the diagnosis because she could get the treatment she needed and could forgive herself. Because along, like with so many girls and women with ADHD, along with this untreated history was a lot of self-blame and a lot of serious depression. Yeah. I think another factor that's really influential right now, at least that I'm noticing in, in my practice, is just layering of the impact of the pandemic and the trauma that everything <laughs> that has gone on there. Yeah. There's also, I think, this component with the ADHD piece where perhaps families, when everybody was home, they started noticing different symptoms that maybe they weren't seeing before. I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit just about teasing out the different diagnoses and where we are now because of everything that's happened over the last two years? So when the pandemic began, March 2020, with lockdowns in most places, within months, in kids and teens, and adults, anxiety and depression went up. Within a year, most adults had returned to baseline. Pre previous coping strategies, a beginning of hybrid work, etc. Kids and teens 
never returned to baseline. In the first year of the pandemic as well, paradoxically, rates of ADHD diagnoses went down. What? Well, the teacher saw the kid in a Zoom box. The kids weren't disrupting. And so teachers who were often a linchpin of providing the feedback to families and, and clinicians about behaviors in school, they, they weren't making those referrals. Does that mean ADHD didn't exist? No. In fact, these are the kids who would click off their Zoom boxes earlier or be hiding under the desk or not learning. We know it's been a national tragedy of the lowered achievement. What we haven't done is broken that down by diagnostic groups like ADHD. I believe that the pandemic has created an educational and mental health crisis for young people. And for people with ADHD, in some ways it's forged some self-reliance, but in other ways it's taken away some of the social connections and the bonds with teachers and other kids that can help promote strengths. So here in the fall of 2022, where we're out of the pandemic, or are we, but most schools are back in person, but without some of the supports back in place, I think it's going to be a rough time for people with ADHD uh, for, for, for a while to come now. Yeah, I agree. I'm so grateful for your time today. We're about out of our time here, though, but I have one last question for you as we wrap up. If you were talking to a young girl adolescent, perhaps, that had just received a diagnosis of ADHD... What would you want her to know? What would you want her to hear? I think a number of things. Many girls have ADHD. It's not as rare as we once thought. Second, it's not your fault. Most people with ADHD, it's because their genes are a little bit different from other people's genes. And everybody has trouble paying attention when the road gets tough or when the tasks get boring. You just may have more of those tendencies. Third, Forgive yourself. Try to downplay those messages you might have been getting from teachers and parents and peers. And of course, teachers and parents and peers need to get on board too. It's a, it's a, it takes a community. And four, getting engaged in treatment doesn't make you stick out like a sore thumb. You can disclose to whom you want, when you want, when you have the right support. And let's really work on what you love doing and do well and find ways to use those for the rewards for learning some of the basic skills. And maybe you're gonna have ultimately a different career and trajectory from, from many other people, but boy, are you gonna be intensely into it when you find that path. Yeah, Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, author of Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for your perceptive questions. When I was diagnosed with ADHD 30-ish years ago, we were really just starting to learn about ADHD. I frequently compare where we were with understanding attention issues back then to where we've been with autism recently. The fact that I was diagnosed with ADHD as a girl was unusual. As a matter of fact, in middle school, my school counselor ran an ADHD support type group. Out of the dozen or so kids that participated, I was the only girl. Girls are much more likely to be missed with many neurodivergent diagnoses, often because we are more likely to mask our symptoms or internalize them than boys are. Clinicians may be more likely to lean toward an anxiety or depression diagnosis when they see ADHD, especially in girls, because for some reason, society has decided those labels don't carry as much stigma. Making generalizations related to any diagnosis based on gender, age, or intelligence can be tricky, and we need to be cautious about doing so. An accurate assessment, diagnosis, and support are the steps our daughters need us to take so they can learn to be independent and successful neurodivergent women. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks again to Stephen Hinshaw. We encourage you to check out his website and the research he's conducted into ADHD. You can find links to all of it on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Also, thank you to our Patreon patrons. 
You've been really helpful by defraying some of the cost of production and distribution of our podcast. If you want to join the Patreon patrons by making a small monthly donation or even just sending in a few dollars one time, you can go to neurodiversitypodcast.com and click on support at the top of the page. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our social media specialist and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio engineer is me, Dave Morris. For all of us here, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.